Hi, welcome to another episode of Oklahoma Senate Sit Down. I'm your host, Aaron Cooper, and today we're joined by Senator Greg McCourtney, the chair of the Health and Human Services Committee here in the Senate. And Senator McCourtney, thanks for joining us here on the uh, the podcast. Glad to have you. Uh, absolutely. We're, we're becoming pros at this uh, Zoom type thing, I guess. It is. I mean, it's really, uh, it's a great uh, time saver. Uh, that way we don't have to be at the Capitol at the same time, or I don't have to... Uh, meet you in your district and take away time from what you're doing in the interim. So this way we can get together and then the folks at home can, can hear from you and all the things that went on this session. So speaking of um, the interim, how's we, the session ended officially on May, Friday, May 29th at 5 PM. So how have, has your summer been so far? What have you been working on? Or I, I, I tried to take a little bit of time off. It had been a while since I had done that. Uh, I'm not real good at taking time off. Um, but tried, tried to take a, a week off there at the beginning and now kind of getting back into the groove and more than anything right now, trying to kind of reassess all of those goals that you had starting the session that never happened because of the coronavirus, uh, really just taking a, a look at where we are and trying to figure out where we need to go now. So speaking of coronavirus, you're, uh, you live in the Ada area. So I'm just curious, uh, to hear perspectives all around Oklahoma, how is the community there handling it, and how are they doing, and, and what's it been like there? Absolutely. So I, it's it's gone, knock on wood, it's gone really well. Okay. Uh, in Pontotoc County, uh, we held even for a long time. We've had a little bit, little bit of a spike uh, recently, uh, but generally things are open back up. Uh, got to teach Sunday school to a actual classroom full of people for the first time last Sunday, which was wonderful to, to get everybody back together. So it's great to see life uh, slowly but surely start moving back uh, to, to something close to normal. Yeah, and, and that's good to hear different perspectives from around the state because a lot of times where the TV stations or the news channels are focused on Oklahoma City, Tulsa, huge metro areas, and the story might be a little bit different in uh, different parts of the state. So good to hear that things are getting back close to normal and, and life's resuming as everyone's still taking their precautions as they see fit. So that's good to hear. Uh, you mentioned this uh, just a second ago. Uh, so let's go back to February of this year, uh, right before session started. So uh, you, I've mentioned your chair of the Health and Human Services Committee, but there are other issues. So what were you focused, what were you heading into the 2020 session? What were you planning to focus on? And what, what kind of goals did you want to accomplish? Yeah, my, my biggest focus, I mean, I, I had a handful of bills. Uh, the Really, the things that I was most passionate about trying to, to get across the finish line uh, were kind of twofold, but in, in the end, one and the same. Uh, one was that I really wanted us to do a, a smart version of Medicaid expansion. Right. Uh, and so what that looks like and, and how we can do that better than what other states have done in a more rational way than what other states have done. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought it was important for us to, to get that done this session. And then alongside that, what's become in the past couple of years, really my biggest passion uh, on the healthcare side is trying to figure out how to bring down the cost of healthcare. Yeah. Uh, it's just absurd how much we pay compared to just 10 years ago. Right. Uh, and I think alongside Medicaid expansion, we could have solved the, that problem, not just for the Medicaid population, but for everybody in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, so those were my two biggest, I mean, when you talk about aspirational goals, mm -hmm. uh, those were the aspirational goals alongside a lot of other uh, bills that were just, small but very necessary things that needed to get done. Uh, yeah, that anyone who looks at their budget or looks at their bills can, you know, verify what you said, their health care costs have skyrocketed. So that would have been, that's something that we'll, you know, continue to work on going forward. We'll get to that in a little bit. So we're rocking along in February. Things are going normal. We're having committee meetings. We're hearing bills. Things are going. And then, uh, and we're hearing, starting to hear internationally and then nationally cases of COVID. And then COVID hit us here in the Senate really before a lot of people in Oklahoma on uh, March 17th, we learned that a Senate employee had tested positive. So that day, uh, the entire Senate was quarantined and, and we consulted with professionals from OU Medicine and we were tested. So I'm curious, um, just your perspective of that day, what were you, what were you feeling? What, what can take us back through that a little bit uh, when kind of the Senate ground to a halt for, for a time? Yeah, it was, 
bizarre, uh, the whole thing, because it really, ours coincided with, uh, the, you know, the thunder and everything that happened there and kind of the world shut down. And, and then uh, a member of the Senate staff was really one of the first people in the state diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And so that put us into quarantine. For me personally, uh, I have a, a cheap, I mean, it's 400 square foot apartment right. in Oklahoma City. I do not have Wi-Fi. I do not have a television. I show up there. I sleep. I wake up. I go back to work. And all of a sudden, I was quarantined to that apartment. Uh, so that was a little painful. Right. Uh, had my, my sister, who lives in the Oklahoma City area, went grocery shopping for me. So I, at least I had some things to eat Yeah. Uh, and spent a, a handful of days there quarantined in, right. inside this apartment. So it was absolutely bizarre i was separated from my family uh, but i didn't want to come home in case i was infected right. the last thing i wanted to do was infect my family or bring it back to my district yeah. and that's really uh something that in hindsight that was at a time when we no one really knew that much not that we know a lot today about coronavirus but we knew even less back then and so we were thinking like the incubation period, so to speak, or the period of infection could be as much as 14 days and you might have to not have human contact for 14 days. I think now we know that time frame has shrunk a lot, but, and that's another perspective people forget. You're not, you represent an area uh, an hour and a half, two hours away from Oklahoma City. And so you have an apartment here. So you were even further isolated and other senators too did the same thing. I think spent their time here in Oklahoma City until they felt comfortable to go home. So that was just, like you said, I think a great word to describe it was bizarre, surreal. I heard a lot of people say, I mean, you never expect that kind of stuff to happen to you. So once you were able to get back home, uh, what was it like for you and your family? I'm just curious how, how you guys juggled the telework, teleschool, all that good stuff. Uh, it, it was uh, a crash course on testing our internet bandwidth. So <laughs> I... Uh, you know, I, I immediately started working from home, and I mean, as, as you know, I mean, we were on Zoom, yeah. you know, two or three Zoom meetings a day at least for me for quite a while. Uh, my wife teaches school, so she was trying to keep up with students and and do all of that. And then I have three teenage kids, and so they're doing Zoom classes. Yeah. My wife's trying to teach some Zoom type classes, and I'm on Zoom meetings. Uh, so we were all in the same house, uh, basically everyone in their room right. uh, opposite sides of the house uh, so it was it was weird uh, it was also really great yeah. in a lot of ways for us um, we're crazy busy mm -hmm. and for something to force us to spend a couple of months in the house just the five of us yeah uh, I think we'll look back on it uh, and, and count quite a few blessings because our family reconnected uh, in a really great way. Uh, spent time together that we would have never gotten. We would have right. spent that time chasing softball games and everything right. else. Uh, and so it, it was definitely a blessing and a curse in a lot of ways for our family. I think that uh, me personally, I feel the same way. And I know I'm sure a lot of people at home feel the same way. You, you were forced to stay home, but the blessing part and the different perspectives you got to spend time with your family and, and that you wouldn't have. And maybe it helps us connect to that um, and helps us try to do that pro more proactively going forward and take time out of our busy lives to spend, slow down, spend time with family. Um, while we were all teleworking, we still were working here in the Senate. So I'm just curious, I, I think I know the answer to this question, but so uh, Senate offices uh, were still operating all remotely. So what were some of the things that folks were calling your office about during that time we were teleworking? It, well, it, it started with coronavirus. Yeah. Uh, it uh, absolutely dominated my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent, I, I would assume, a lot more time than most of your average senators. Uh, we ended up creating a healthcare preparedness coalition right. uh, during that time frame. Uh, and then kind of about halfway through that craziness, the unemployment right. issue picked up and, and that's still going on. And I, uh, my assistant who God bless her, uh, her full-time job right now is unemployment. Yeah. Uh, just trying to help the people in, in my district, uh, get, get the unemployment benefits that they've been promised and that they desperately need. So, uh, between those two things, I was 
working much, much more than 40 hours a week for a while, to say the least. Right. Yeah. And it's, and we're, you know, eight, 10, however many weeks pass and we're still working on that. We're here, starting to hear more success stories, at least on the unemployment front, which is good news. There's still a lot of people that are waiting on their claims, but it, hopefully it looks like things are picking up speed. And I know your office and others here in the Senate have been able to uh, help shepherd some of those cases, people with um, high levels of, um, of, of issues that need help. And we've been able to, to get some of those off high center. So that's a good success story uh, to hear from the Senate. So that's, that's always good to hear. I know uh, here in the pro Tim's office, we just this morning, as we're recording this, we had a couple come through on the positive uh, good success stories. So that's always good to hear. You mentioned the healthcare working group and I was, on several of those calls with you. And so one of the things I wanted you to touch on quickly was um, the healthcare working group was just uh, you and connecting and other, some other centers connecting with members of the healthcare community, doctors, uh, nurse, uh, nursing uh, officials, pharmacy, the whole gamut, the whole spectrum, and just kind of hearing what they were doing, how we could help, what ways we could connect them with others to help solve problems. So just walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, I, in, in its most basic form, I there was a massive problem at the start of the coronavirus mm -hmm. uh, where everyone's house was on fire. Uh, and really, it was the governor's office was the only people with fire hoses. Right. Uh, you know, we were all back home. We weren't uh, really in the session and we couldn't pass laws fast enough to fix these things no matter what. And so it fell on the governor's office. And so I realized really quickly that you had, whether it's hospitals, uh, your family doctors, your specialist doctors, your nursing homes, uh, all of those groups were all yelling and screaming that, you know, they had issues that needed to be taken care of there was no real one point person to, to put that all together yeah. and to deliver that package of messages to the governor's office. So the governor's office could do what they needed to do. And so uh, there was kind of this bog down of you, the governor's staff is not nearly as big as most people think it is. Right. I mean, you, right. you've got just a few people who are trying to do a massive amount of work. And so I kind of stepped in and I asked the pro tem, uh, if, if he would allow us, even though it's not the natural job of the Senate, but it was something we could do at that moment uh, to set up this coalition where I could try to, to bring all of those voices in the healthcare community together mm -hmm. uh, to speak with one voice, and then we could send, have that conversation and send that conversation to the governor's office. Right. Uh, so that the governor's office wasn't having the same conversation 15 times with 15 different groups. Yeah. Uh, and so that ended up being twice weekly conference calls for six or eight weeks. I'm not sure how long. A lot of the executive orders that you saw come out of the governor's office started and, and worked through that coalition. Right. Uh, a lot of the, I think, real successes that we had was kind of, the healthcare industry communicating with with me and Senator Racino and Senator Hayes who who stepped in in a huge way. The the three of us uh, kind of packaging all of that together, working with the governor's office and and getting done what needed to get done without anyone yeah. trying to take credit for for the work, just trying yeah. to get it done. It's a really good example of kind of a whole of government approach. We were. Uh, you and the Senate uh, were stepping in to see how we could help, and like you said when you have uh, 15, 20, 25 people all wanting a piece of your time, it can be hard. And so it was good, I think, good to funnel that communication and boil it down to the essence because that was really in a emergency crisis mode that we were in early on in the pandemic and the quarantine where we didn't know what was going to happen when there were forecasts of just unimaginable toll on the state. So it was, I think it was really good and really successful. and and a lot of those things came to fruition. So um, during quarantine, the Senate met one time uh, in a special session. Um, people may remember those photos of senators uh, and then House members in their chamber wearing masks and gloves on the floor. And we met to approve the catastrophic health emergency. Uh, so walk us through real quickly 
why that was important uh, for the Senate to come in. Again, that was uh, on April 6th when we met, so very early on in the pandemic. Right, so I, I, it was essential for us to come in. Uh, at that point, again, I, I thought best case scenario at that point was that there would be 80 people in my district that died. That was best case scenario from all the data that we had. And so that, that catastrophic health emergency was the Senate saying, hey, during this pandemic, we want the governor to be able to do whatever he possibly can to save lives in our state. And so uh, we came in and took a vote that I never in my life, if you would have told me I would vote to, to give the governor yeah. of the state that much power, I would, would have told you you were crazy. Uh, but it was absolutely the right vote at that, that time. And I, I'm proud of, of the legislature for, for coming in and, and doing what we had to do at that moment, for sure. And that catastrophic health emergency was kind of formulated and worked on and passed in the wake of 9-11 when we were and, and if you read the plan you can see that it's looks to things like bioterrorism or thing you know so and it's even talks about transporting people around and patients and stuff and I, and I know experts at the time probably had some vision of a health pandemic like that but uh, so it was really interesting and, and unprecedented that had never been done before it was the first time and and the governor had sweeping powers, but it was the right thing to do at the time because we were right in the thick of it. Uh, and that kind of led to something. So now we get to um, May and we have to come back in. We pass a budget and we start passing legislation. But we also in the Senate, let me back up. Uh, while we were working remotely, the Senate is charged with advising and consenting to governor's nominations to many agencies, boards and commissions in the state. And I think this year we had... Uh, well more than 100 and probably more like 150 close to 200 executive nominations to consider and we did that remotely with senators um, participating from home like you are in this podcast and the executive noms the nominees themselves participating from their home and so you had a couple of executive noms that you sponsored and, and helped run through the process tell us a little bit about that about that and any exec noms uh, from your district that that stood out yeah, well, I mean, there, there's one just because it's it's somebody that I, I knew really well, and that uh, uh, her name's Mary Terry. She's now one of the real estate commissioners awesome. uh, for the state of Oklahoma. Um, absolutely been a, a leader in that industry nationwide. Uh, so it, it is, it's one of those things people don't even know about the Senate a lot of times that that we have a big part in the advice and consent uh, and really in helping many times to identify talent in our own district, people who are really good at things and recruiting them and, and getting them to serve the state with their talents. And so uh, we, one of those nominees this year was, was Mary Terry. And I, I think that, uh, that she'll be a huge asset for the state of Oklahoma for sure. And I would be remiss if I didn't, say for anyone who's watching this, um, and if you're interested in serving on an agency board or commission, contact Senator McCourtney, uh, contact Senator Treat here in the Pro Tem's office because there are lots of positions to fill and they're, they're all important and they all serve a, a great purpose. And we need quality people who are willing to give of their time and their talents. And, and it sounds like uh, uh, Mary Terry there is, is one of those high quality people that we need to serve the state and so, uh, reach out to Senator McCourtney or reach out to us here in the Pro Tem's office. We'll be happy to connect you and let you know of the many fabulous opportunities to serve your state on an agency board or commission. Um, so now let's, <laughs> let's fast forward uh, the final two, two and a half weeks of session or so towards the end of May. We come back in, we start passing a budget, we start passing legislation. Uh, it's limited in scope. Uh, typically in a session, the legislature will send the governor four, 500, 600 bills for the governor to sign or veto. And this year, that number was scaled back considerably to less than 200. And a couple of your bills um, made it to the finish line. And one of them, uh, it's a House Bill 2930. I think it relates back to something that was a part of the catastrophic health emergency. So one of the things that did was let the governor waive some 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 statutes so that first responders and law enforcement could could have data shared with them about people's uh, uh, health status or their COVID status. Let's be specific there. 
And so your legislation kind of let that continue, that process continue even after the health emergency expired. So tell us a little bit about why that's important for law enforcement to know about someone's potential coronavirus um, status when they go respond to a call. Yeah, and this was something that, that we learned through this whole coronavirus process. And uh, there, are, there are a lot of things we learned we can be more prepared in the future, but this one was, was a really big one. And that is uh, the state of Oklahoma has uh, laws on medical privacy that go above and beyond what the federal HIPAA yeah. laws are. And so because our laws are so stringent, when we got into the pandemic, the ability for first responders to know what they were about to walk into when they went to a house was hindered. Yeah. And so we were putting our police, our sheriffs, deputies, uh, paramedics somewhat, uh, especially in rural communities, some of the paramedics didn't even know what they were walking into right. when they went to a house. And so we passed a law already to prepare us if we ever face this again, uh, that we can get that information out in a safe way, in a secure way, uh, in a way that doesn't harm patient privacy, but also does protect our first responders. So uh, that's a, a bill that wasn't on my radar when session began, but it was ended up one of the very few uh, yeah. bills that I passed this year. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's going to be helpful in the long term and, and, and for the next time that this may happen, we'll be even more prepared. And not only is it good for the health and safety, but it also lets uh, first responders plan as far as their, um, their uh, um, stockpile of PPE and, and supplies of that nature. It helps them to make sure they secure that when they know what kind of call they're going on, you know. Uh, and then also, I, I love this bill, Senate Bill 1423. It's it's kind of simple in, in, in nature, but I think it'll have huge impact long term. So tell us a little bit about Senate Bill 1423. Right. So that that's a tobacco 21 is, is how everybody knows it. Uh, the federal government moved the smoking or not smoking, but the tobacco age up to 21 years of age. Right. Uh, and so... Our state law still said 18, so it was in con conflict with the federal law. Uh, a lot of people don't know that there are a lot of federal funds that come along with the enforcement of the tobacco laws. Right. And so the state of Oklahoma having law that didn't match federal law, uh, we were actually at risk of losing a lot of money. Uh, and then of course, not being able to actually enforce the federal law. And so right. uh, this just updated our statutes to match those those new federal statutes so that the tobacco age in Oklahoma is, is now officially 21 years old, both state and federal law say that, and that allows uh, state law enforcement to actually enforce those laws and to draw down those federal funds for doing it. That's great. And also, you know, here in Oklahoma, as you well know, and I know you, I've heard you talk about this before, um, our health in Oklahoma suffers from high rates of smoking. And so anything we can do to address that, to get people healthier, to smoke less or to smoke not at all, uh, is something good for the health of our state in the long term. Uh, yes, and I, I could go on and on. I, I, I know you want me to be brief, but I, absolutely uh, tobacco use and the lack of exercise uh, and poor diet, they attribute to about 60% of the deaths in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, so that law in itself will save lives, but in the long run, will stay, save the Oklahoma or the taxpayers of Oklahoma mm -hmm. a ton of money because uh, the healthier we are as a state, the less we have to spend on health care. Great. Yeah. Good to hear. Okay. So I think that's about all I wanted to cover. Um, and I appreciate your time before I let you go. So now the Senate and the legislature is in what we call the interim, which just simply means the time when we're not in session here at the Capitol, but uh, it's not like we're on summer break, the work still is ongoing. So tell us a little bit about uh, what kind of plans you have in this interim. Uh, one of the things the Senate does uh, and the House does in the interim is have uh, interim studies and it's a chance to kind of dive deeper. So give us a little uh, highlight of what kind of plans you have um, this summer and fall as we get ready for next year. Well, I, I've already mentioned uh, the cost of health care. We're definitely going to take, take a look at that. Uh, there are quite a few different programs that other states have tried. Uh, one is, is called Right to Shop, which I'm completely fascinated in. And, and so we're going to study that. We're going to look at it. And, and basically, it, it gives consumers 
the right to know how much their health care is going to cost before they go buy it. Oh, wow. And right now, we don't. We yeah. have no idea what we're about to spend until after we go get the care and then we get a bill and we have to pay it. Right. Uh, so I, I, I want to look into that and, and a lot of different ways that we can uh, finally get control on health care cost. Uh, I'm assuming uh, the outcome of the state question on Medicaid expansion probably will determine uh, what my life looks like. Uh, if, if that state question passes, uh, it is my assumption that the pro tem is going to ask me to uh, to dedicate a whole lot of my uh, yeah. next year into trying to implement that plan the best way as possible. Uh, having a state question uh, that that puts a federal program into the state constitution uh, is going to be a real challenge. Uh, so if that passes, I'm pretty sure that the rest of my year will be dedicated <laughs> in large part to that. So uh, wait until the end of June to find out what, what my, what my <laughs> fall really looks like. I think. Right. Right. That sounds like a, potentially uh, we don't know how the voters are going to decide, but potentially that sounds like it could be a huge um, issue that you're going to devote a lot of time, but, we're glad here in the Senate that, that you would be the person working on that. So thanks, Senator McCourtney, for your time and appreciate you joining us here on Oklahoma Senate Sit Down. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again sometime in the future to get an update on some of these issues. And so thanks again for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And thanks for joining us um, here on the podcast. Please feel free to to share this, like us, uh, subscribe, and, and this is uh, we'll have more episodes from other members of the Oklahoma Senate in the future. So thanks for joining us here on Oklahoma Senate. Senate.